Hi, I'm Chris Sarandon, and welcome to Cooking by Heart, where we revisit the vivid memories of the food we grew up with and the people and the stories attached to that time in our lives. Today, my guest is the inimitable Seth Rudetsky. Aside from being the unofficial encyclopedia of Broadway, Seth Rudetsky is an actor, musician, comedian, writer, and he tours with his solo show doing his signature deconstructions of amazing performing, like Betty Buckley belting out the title role in Drood, and he compares and contrasts them with interesting performances, like the Osmonds singing a medley from Fiddler on the Roof. I love it. He also tours with the Seth Concert Series, where he matches wits and accompanies amazing Broadway stars, like Audrey McDonald, Jesse Mueller, Cheetah Rivera, and my dear wife, Joanna Gleason. As an actor, he has starred opposite Sutton Foster in one, a one-night fundraiser of their playing a song, as well as the Roundabout Theater's Broadway revival of The Ritz with Rosie Perez. He co-wrote with Jack Plotnick and co-starred on Broadway in the musical Disaster, which is an homage to 1970s disaster movies and was a New York Times critic's pick. As a writer, he was nominated for three Emmys for his comedy writing on The Rosie O'Donnell Show, and he's written many books, including two young adult novels published by Random House and the recently published Musical Theater for Dummies. Thank you. He and his husband, James Wesley, not only do three Broadway-themed cruises around the world every year, but they spend much of their time combining the arts with raising money for various charities. During the COVID lockdown, they co-hosted the twice-daily live stream called Stars in the House, where they had reunions with wonderful Broadway shows like Into the Woods, Ragtime, and The Producers, as well as TV shows like Grey's Anatomy, Little House on the Prairie, and ER with George Clooney. By June 2021, the live stream raised over $1 million for the Actors Fund. Bravo! Seth was a classical piano performance major at the Oberlin College Conservatory of Music and can be heard every day on Sirius XM Radio, where he is the afternoon Broadway DJ, as well as hosting the weekly talk show, Seth Speaks. Well, talk about a multi-talented, extraordinarily prolific man, Seth Rudetsky. Thank you for joining me on Cookie by Heart. Thank you, Chris. Good to see you again, my friend. Uh, good to see you. And by the way, I did Seth's show on Sirius XM, and I had a wonderful time doing it. And thank you again for inviting me. I know. I have to have you back because there's so much of your career I did not discuss. I was actually just thinking about that. So I need a second time to where we talk about so many other things. Well, let me know. And we will do it. Actually, I have some great stories, too. Uh, so let's get back to Cooking by Heart, because the first question I always ask, and I have no idea what the answer to this, by the way, is is provenance. What's your provenance? Where are you from? Because it tells me so much about all of us, about uh, the subject of the show. I was born in New York City. I spent the first five years of my life in Jamaica, Queens, and then I moved to the five towns on Long Island for my formative years. So basically New York City yeah. metropolitan area. Yeah. All right. Mom and dad? Um, both worked in the school system. I both, you know, kind of grew up in the projects in New York, signature Jewish. Dad was an assistant principal at public school. My mom was a supervisor of special education in the New York City public schools. So they both worked in the school system. Right. So they're both working parents. So who was the cook at home? You know, interestingly, they split up when I was 13. Before that, I would say my dad did much of the cooking against, uh, gender roles. And after that, um... Hungry Man did a lot of the cooking, which was the frozen TV dinners I'd always have after my parents right. split up. And then when I started going to college and I would come home, uh, my mom, my mom, we had kind of a resurgence about Judaism and we'd have big Shabbos dinners and big Shabbos afternoon meals. And my mom did tons and tons of cooking. What was their specialty? Um, my dad, I have to say it was very experimental. I remember we had like a yogurt machine. It was very kind of late seventies where you trying to make your Ooh. own yogurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in theory, it sounds good if you like the taste of yogurt, but if you want sour milk, you can have it for yourself, so it's disgusting. He also, um, the best thing he ever made, and this was in the days when I was not a vegetarian, is something called sausage bread. I can't tell how good it was. It was bread with cheese inside it and sausages, 
It was amazing. Unfortunately, I can't really eat it now. Maybe with sausage, like fake sausage. But mm -hmm. oh my God, that was amazing. Now, did he make the bread, bread from yeah, scratch? Yeah, he was like really into cooking, yeah. And he would also, I think, sell, I think he also made like special muffins that he would sell at like local health food stores. He was Mr. Ooh. Cook. Yeah, he had it going on. When you say he sold the health food stores, was he selling whole grain products? That sort I think of he was like selling like his own, it's interesting, he was always like entrepreneuring. I mean, he's still alive, but he's always entrepreneuring things. So I know he sold like some kind of signature muffins. I don't remember what they were, but at one point he got his vending license. And I would be with him on the street and he sold something called OJ Banana Blast, which was orange juice and bananas mixed up with ice. And we would we had a vending license and I would meet him on Saturdays after the divorce and like sell these drinks. Right. And but this isn't what he did for a living. No, he was an assistant principal, but I guess yeah. it was just, you know, he had child support and he's just always haggling for, <laughs> you know, haggling for extra money. And also, if you work in the school system, you have more time off for Correct. vacations, that sort of thing. So you can... Uh, Give your weekends free, afternoons free, right. after, yeah, summer's free. So you're totally right. He just, he always had a side hustle, as we say, in the acting business. Interesting. Interesting. And mom? She, when, when I got older and she started making her Shabbos meals, again, this is before I was a vegetarian, but she would make this amazing like chicken breast that had like plums and dates. I'm, I definitely have a sweet tooth. I'm not, you know, savory yeah. sweet. I'm all sweet. So it was like plums and dates and like a sweet sauce that I was obsessed with. She'd always make that. But then she also just made everything like amazing matzo ball soup, very signature, you know, gefilte fish, really right. good um, Jewish cooking. My mom is mm -hmm. great at that. And did your dad do any of the entree cooking? Any of the, the meal cooking? You know what? I, Mostly specialties. Yeah. I know that my dad was in charge of barbecues. So like some of my fondest memories are in our backyard, we had barbecues when I was a kid and he definitely would like get the coal going and like make signature like hamburgers and hot dogs. But at night growing up, I don't remember him making any main courses. Mm. When I graduated college and I always needed food, he would drop off, um, again, before I was vegetarian, amazing chicken. But my favorite thing he would make is he would get a blender and put in potatoes and carrots and I think heavy cream and whip it all together. I can't tell you how delicious that was. And he would drop it off for me so I wouldn't have to buy food for the week. Oh, so good. Really? Oh, so good. But yeah, potatoes, carrots, heavy cream, and I guess salt. It's kind of like mashed potatoes, but yeah, the yeah. carrots make it a little sweeter and the heavy cream makes it a little more delicioso. Yeah, 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 exactly. Do you have siblings? Yes. Uh, not to bring everybody down, but I have a brother that passed away when I was 19 and I have oh, two I'm sisters. Sorry. Yeah, which is a whole story in itself, but yeah. I have two sisters and... um they go in, like my sister Nancy is, is, uh, still has, you know, is more on the religious Jewish side. So she definitely does a whole lot of Shabbos cooking for her family. My mm -hmm. sister Beth is not really religious, but my sister Beth is more like my dad. And is always like, I'm making gluten-free, non-dairy, vegan. She's always making these like experimental <laughs> right. muffins. I, you right. know, she's kind of famous for making potato salad and making my brother eat it, but she didn't know you have to boil the potatoes first. So she just cut up potatoes, but, and she was like, you have to eat it. I made a few. So like, I, you know, we all have our cooking mishaps. That was Beth's. Crunchy potato salad. Yeah, not tasty, but crunchy. Good for your teeth. Yes, yes. So what was it like around the dinner table? Did you guys, was it a general sort of every evening you sat down yeah. at a certain time and ate? I, you know, it's hard. It's funny. It's hard for me to remember, but I do know that anytime friends would come over to my house to eat, and this is a little bit later also, definitely I have clear memories later in life when I'd invite people over for like the Seder or... Shabbos meals, everyone was always in a state of shock at our dinner table. I didn't know it was weird, but basically everyone in my family spoke as fast as I did. You had to work really hard to get a story in. If your story really didn't have an amazing build and a climax immediately, someone would say, not interested, and you'd have to move on. So oh, really? most of the meals were about basically beginning my com my stand-up comedy career. It was all about stories with amazing beginning meals and ends. You had to be right. funny. and. People, every time they come over, like, I've never witnessed this before. I'm like, witness what before? But it's it was, I'm used to it, but other people were in a state of shock from it. Right. And it was a tough room. Oh, my brother's signature expression was not interested. I mean, always not interested. And you had to move, you had to really nail your stories. Wow. So, yeah. so, so you were, in, in essence, you were gonged. Yeah, exactly. But like, it wasn't really offensive. You were like, oh, I better work on that story. Like, you know, you, your feelings weren't really hurt. You're like, okay, well, tomorrow it's going to be better. Wow. That's how I learned my comedy. A lot of pressure. Well, that, that's, uh, that's the essence of comedy.
in in many ways, and that is that you have to perform under pressure and you have to read the room. Yes. And if you're killing, you're doing great. And if you're not, you're out of there. Out onto the next act. Wow. So the food was not the the uh, the center attraction when you guys were sitting around the table doing this. Um, interesting. I. Again, I'm going to keep relating things to when I was in college. Definitely Shabbos, it was like, Shabbos, which is Friday night, and then Shabbos lunch, it was like a thousand courses. I mean, it was always like, so my mom would like put out the challah, which is the bread, yeah. and then she would buy all the storeboard, like it was like baba ganoush and hummus. So you'd be basically full after just having that, because you'd have six pieces of challah and all the hummus and baba ganoush. So a little a little Israeli influence in yeah. there Oh, definitely. Well. Yeah. yeah, definitely Israeli. And it was so good that she's like, I shouldn't be eating this, but you'd be on your six piece of challah and you're like, oh, well, no more room. But then she would put out like amazing, the like the chicken with the plums and the tomatoes and and always like couscous. And there was always actually a giant salad. Like the food was definitely the focus after I graduated college and my mom became very on the Jewish side. Like the food right. was amazing. This was a, 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 not a literal conversion, but a conversion of taste? Religiosity. No, it's like, basically, and again, not to bring people down, but after my brother died, I think people kind of searched for something. And my mother definitely was like, the religion kind of helped her deal with the mourning. So Mm -hmm. my mother and my two sisters became more religious. And part of being Uh, religious was like having a Shabbos, the kind of community. She'd have a Shabbos Friday night and a Shabbos afternoon. So that's what it was more about. Right. But my mom grew up like her mother... I think she was kosher. It was that kind of thing where you, you're kind of kosher, but you're not really religious. So I think her mother was on the kosher side. My mother would tell me stories about like the bathtub would have like fish in it. I think like that's what they did back in the 30s. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, yeah. God, I'm going to vomit. I had a conversation, wonderful conversation with Hal Linden. Oh, I love him. Whom you know well, I'm sure. And you did the Rothschilds with him. Yes, that's right. And uh, Hal t- uh, mentioned kosher for him he always remembered it as being the, he called it the first food and drug administration. Yeah, that's a good point because it wasn't, it was, a lot of people say it was really about health. If you talk to someone religious, yeah, they're going to exactly. say, no, it was what God said. But if you talk to other people, yeah. they're going to say it was also much healthier to just not, you know, have Very much about health, feeders. yes. Right, exactly. The shellfish, yeah. the, the whole, yeah, traif. Exactly. Uh, it was unhealthy at the time. Yeah, and that's how my mom grew up. So I think it was easy for her to go back to that style of Judaica cooking. I mean, I definitely mm-hmm. really enjoyed it. And I miss not being I'm a vegetarian. I, you know, I miss definitely some of those chicken dishes. My favorite meal that my mom made was roast beef. I mean, it's so funny. It's like things I will just not eat anymore, but oh my God, yeah. it was so delicious. My, you know, my dad would make steak. Ah, oh, so good. Oh, really? Yeah, my dad taught me how to make, it was like, what is it? Three minutes on one side, five minutes on the other. That's what we always said in the oven. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. But did he do it by touch or did he do it by time? No, by time. He just told me yeah. that that was the formula. And I would follow it, but I just, I became vegetarian and then forget yeah, it. Yeah, I, I have learned after talking to uh, trained chefs and my son, who trained as a chef, that uh, it's always about touch. Oh. You know, the difference between rare, medium, and well done by how it feels. And, and they talk about uh, using your thumb as the, the sort of template for it. Different places on your thumb will tell you, uh, this is well done, this is less well done, and this is rare. I'll tell my dad. I mean, he's 91, but he could always learn something new, I guess. Hey, you know, or you use a meat thermometer. Correct. Or you use minutes, whatever. So do you remember the f- the first five years? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, it's kind of the end of my parents having a happy marriage. So it's like we oh. would, we had. So a, that would be, yeah, that would stamp your memory. Yeah, sure. we had a trailer and we'd spend the summer in Montauk living in a trailer, which was really, now I, as an adult, I don't know how they did it, but. I loved it as a kid. So I'd share a bed with my brother, two sisters in the bunk above. There was a kitchen table which converted into a bed that my parents slept in. And we would, my dad and I would go to literally the Atlantic Ocean and pick mussels off mm. of the rocks and then bring them home. My mom would cook them and they were amazing. I mean, it was mm. so delicious. Oh, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Oh my God, that was good. We went to a place called Gosman's Dock, which is a beautiful restaurant in Montauk. And mm-hmm. I had lobster. So I definitely remember those years. And like I said, we all went on vacation as a family. So, but it was kind of the end of their, my sister and sisters and brother have much more vacation memories, but I'm the youngest. I'm 10 years younger than my oldest sister. So this was like Mm -hmm. the tail end. And then Long Island, you know, I remember that, but I'm not really a fan of Long Island. (laughs) Get the (laughs) F out. (laughs) Shit, I hate it. And the food preparation when you were in the trailer, what was that like? You know, I 
Basically I, over a fire or... I barely remember, but we stove? had a kitchen. You know what? I don't remember. I just remember maybe we were outdoors. I just remember the mussels and the boiling yeah. them in a big pot. Ah. And it was so good. But yeah, I, don't, yeah, I was yeah, too yeah. young. I, started, I stopped going there when I was five. Different tastes as you were going to school? Were you, were you taking lunch home from school? I mean, to, to school from home? No. You know, it's interesting. My mom would like make me... I definitely was the kind of kid, like, I didn't really complain about food, but I would, there's so many things that I would get that I didn't like. Like, when I was at home, my mom would often make me, like, cream cheese and jelly sandwiches, which I really hate. It's just a gross combination, but I was just like, well, I guess I have to eat it. And I think oftentimes my birthday, I get a fruitcake, which I also didn't like. Nothing against my mom. I just don't think I ever said anything. Now I'm like, why didn't I just say, can I, like... Why didn't you speak up? I don't know. I will tell you the one <laughs> thing, which is... I was thinking about those Vanity Fair articles, like things you may not know about me, but I will say that my entire life, I'm like completely disgusted by tuna fish. Like if it's around me, I want to vomit. And it makes me so really? sick that I'd have to put, when I would go to camp on um, my application that I was allergic to tuna fish because I was so scared they were going to make me eat it. It literally makes me sick. So that right. my entire, so my family would always eat it. And I was like, you can't, and they would know like they're not allowed to eat in the room with me. I mean, like that was, I, it's disgusting. And this, uh, this aversion, have you ever traced it to it's being, cause some people do have aversions to food because they have allergies. Right. No, no? because bizarrely enough. Was the smell? Yeah. Cause when I would eat sushi, I love tuna because it doesn't really smell, but when ah, it's in yeah. that can, yep. I, I guess if I want a pile of garbage, I'll eat it, but I'd rather not. <laughs> It's disgusting. Okay. Yeah, we'll cross that off your list. Oh my uh, god! And and so when you went to school, you ate school food. Yes, those. Oh my god, lunches at school. That was the. I loved it. They were so good. I really. Oh, oh my god, I loved it. This yeah, is the first. Is that weird? I remember just really well. But by the way, I would eat cream cheese and jelly sandwiches and hate them. So anything that was relatively right. good was I liked. Yeah, 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 I remember like franks and beans. Like I just I loved anything they served. They always had good desserts. Yeah, it was it was delish. Um, yeah, I don't have any complaints about food school, and, and also different, totally different from home. I wouldn't say no because it wasn't really Jewishy at home either. No, it was like it was. Well, I wouldn't. No, I don't know. It was kind of. It was just so, so interesting. I wish I had a more um, highfalutin palate. No, I no, really no. didn't. But they would be like Frankfurter cheeseburger. It was kind of whatever you ate at home. It reminded me of what I ate at school. It wasn't any right. different. But I had a major sweet tooth, so I was just constantly obsessed uh. with. My, my nickname was Sugar Freak. My father would call me Sugar Freak. And really? at one point he was like, I bet if you, you know, drank sugar water, you'd like it. And literally after he said that, I would come home from school, put three tablespoons of sugar in water and drink it. I was like, it is delicious. And you, to this day, you're not a diabetic or? Um, I haven't seen a doctor in 30 years. No, I'm not a diabetic. No, I just, um, <laughs> no, I just, I love sugar. It's, and I never, that's the other thing I'll tell you that maybe you'll be interested in palate wise. I always thought when you get older, you get adult tastes, but I never yes. graduated to that. So first of all, like I never liked borscht to like Roquefort dressing, all those things that adults ate. But on top of that, people think I'm an alcoholic because I'm like, I don't drink. I'm like, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I hate the taste of alcohol. If I want to drink Robitussin, I will get a bottle, but it's disgusting. Like when people drink, beer, like I need a cold beer. I'm like, why would you want someone's urine put in the refrigerator and then made cold. It's so gross. Or look at me pina colada. I'm like, it tastes good, except for whatever is making it disgusting. Take out the disgustingness and give me the sugar part. So Which I never- is the alcohol. Yes. Yeah. I never graduated to, you know, I'll like take a cup of black coffee. No, I'll take a cup of coffee with a ton, a pint of half and half and six tablespoons of sugar. I never graduated to that adult taste where you're supposed to like disgusting things. Hmm. How interesting. It's disgusting. So were there any, uh, as you were in uh, those school years, mm -hmm. were there any discoveries that occurred? That is food discoveries, things that you went, oh my God, where's this been all my life? Um, I will say the food memories I have of being young are, my dad would pick me up, so my piano lesson, I'm, as you know, I'm a pianist. Yeah. That's the most happy fellow. But my yeah, dad yeah. would pick me up for my piano lessons and we would go to Sizzler. That was my treat treat. So my absolute favorite was, I think there was like a steak and lobster meal that was like $6. And if I like- Surf and turf. Yes. Oh my God. So if I begged, I would get that. That was like a major treat when I was a child. And I think lobster wasn't a normal thing for most kids to eat, but I loved it so much. Then my father and I discovered that when you went to Burger King, if you asked for like 
extra tomatoes or whatever on your Whopper, it would be made fresh. So that was our big discovery. We'd walk in and be like, I'll take a Whopper, but can I have, and you'd ask for one extra thing and be like, hey, it's fresh. So those were like the big deals that I would do with my dad. It's like, get these, like, definitely the Whopper. It was always about being picked up from my piano last time when I would eat. So Whoppers mm-hmm. were amazing. Not Big Macs. Whoppers were amazing. Surf and turf. And then, I, I mean, I think just a lot of kids don't grow up eating seafood, but because, like my friend Jack Plotnick from the Midwest, he'd be like, I get sushi. I get cucumber. I'm like, that's not sushi. But I think people for the people that are not surrounded by water, they're scared yeah. of fish. But I just grew up because I would go to Montauk. Now, of course, I don't eat fish anymore because, again, I'm a downer vegetarian. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I had pretty open-minded taste. And then the big... The big influence in my life is my sister, Beth, who's 10 years older, who was also a pianist. That's why I became a pianist. But she definitely kind of went through a health food phase or just was always experimental. So by the time I got to high school, she would take me out to eat and I would get tofu. I would get these kind of real, you know, the early 80s just had a lot of, you know, veggie burgers. So my vegetarian tastes really began with my sister, Beth, who would take me out Mm -hmm. to this really cool. Arnold's Turtle was a place down in the village. All these cool experimental vegetarian places. And that's where my palate, I feel, really expanded. Uh, and well, that that's what led you into vegetarianism as a as a lifestyle. I think I was comfortable with vegetarian food, but I was a major meat eater. Like my favorite meal at Oberlin, there was a taco bar. I would get, um, you know, the tortilla, right. ladle on the ground beef, ladle on the sour cream and the cheese. It was my absolute favorite. But after <laughs> keeping up my brother, I know it's a downer, but after my brother died and my family became religious, I would feel guilty because my family was kosher and I wasn't. So my compromise was I would only eat kosher meat. I would only eat kosher meat. So I went back mm. to my mom's house. I would have whatever kosher meat she prepared. But when I would go out to a restaurant, I'd be like, oh, I don't want to eat something non-kosher. So I wouldn't eat meat. But I'm a major animal lover. So after a couple of years, I was like, I'm already not eating meat. And I can't believe they murder animals. So I was suddenly like, why am I eating any meat? So I yeah, just yeah. stopped all meat eating. But it was really because my family became religious and I didn't want to eat non-kosher meat. That's how it all began. Ah, and I was comfortable. Yes, yeah, how it started. And my comfortableness with vegetarian food, because my sister was always, my sister would do these, what we call weird things. But of course, now she was smart. Whenever she would get a pizza or a hamburger, she would blot it with a napkin and we thought she was so annoying, but she, it was her taking the oil off. So she always kind of yeah. had a healthy mindset. And in that case, it was grease. It was grease, yeah. Yeah. And I just remember- it was animal being, fat, saturated right. fat. She, yeah. So Beth was always health minded, but I also, but back to my mother making me cream cheese and jelly sandwiches, she definitely had a, you weren't allowed to think a different way type of mentality. Cause I remember my sister Nancy would always be like, oh, I love pancakes, but I hate syrup. And my mother would be like, of course you like syrup. It's delicious. And she would just pour the syrup on. So basically, my mother would sort of do whatever she thought was good and you just had to follow suit. And the other thing I'm remembering, I'm, all these memories coming back, I quote unquote yeah, hated yeah. cheese when I was a kid. I don't know if that's true, but my family would make me omelets and I'd be like, I don't want any cheese. And they'd go, there's no cheese in your part of the omelet, which I now know was a complete lie. But I always believed that somehow they left the cheese out of this one Ouch. part of a giant, whatever. <laughs> what? They were all lying to me all the time. I was the youngest. Nobody cared. Well, you know, we do we do what we have to sometimes with children. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you have four the, of them. I, I, I'm sure there are uh, uh, what parental therapists who would say, no, 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 you have to be uh, completely honest with your children. They learn from you how to to deal in the world, and you don't want to uh, send them out as uh, um, pathological liars. But at the same time, every once in a while, you gotta. You have. I mean, sometimes you though, when your kids sort of knows what the truth is, it's hard to gaslight them. Because my sister Nancy yeah. has a classic story. Her daughter's name is Rachel Sarah. Again, religious. And when Rachel Sarah was around three years old, every time the car would stop, Rachel Sarah would immediately go, shit, because she was so used to my sister Nancy always being late that Nancy would stop the car and go, shit. And so Rachel Sarah thought, oh, every time a car stops, you say shit. You say shit. So Nancy had to start saying, no, 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 I'm saying sip. So she literally had to gaslight her. So anyway, it doesn't always work, but I just love that. It's like, that's what you do when a car stops. That's shit. a great thing. How, how old was her daughter at the time? Like three. And Nancy had yeah. a gaslighter at her because it was, they'd be with strangers and Nancy would turn off the car. Yeah. Shit. That's a, right. <laughs> that's a great story. Oh boy. All right. So, so let me go back a little bit. Sure. Uh, you are now a what? A teen in Long Island? Yes. Sure. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, my, dre- my dad. A dreary time? Yeah. Well, first of all, gay. Knew I was gay at a very young age. So basically, oh, really? yeah. So 
you know, always very low self-esteem because I'm gay, but countered with very high self-esteem because I'm super talented. Yeah, and smart. Thank you. Yeah, smart was just sort of a given in my family, but the talent really like, you know, my yeah. school lauded me for my piano skills, but also hated me for being gay. So I lived in this weird double world of like, I hate myself, but I'm also amazing, aren't I? So just weird conflicts, couldn't tell anybody I was gay. As, yeah. as, like I always tell people, if you may, if you made fun of being Jewish, you go to your parents and your parents go like, we're Jewish and it's actually amazing to be Jewish, but you can't go to your parents and go, I'm gay. Your parents don't go, that's amazing. Like they're also devastated over it. So no one, to, so a lot of torment as a kid. And were, were you out to your parents? No, not, no. I mean- no, not officially. This was, you know, the 80s. Nobody was out. Yeah, yeah, no, nobody was. But I, I mean, there were, I've heard of rare cases where kids confided to their parents and basically their parents told them, given the the uh, the cultural uh, uh, approbation of, of uh, just gay in general, that just keep it to yourself until it's time. Yeah, I don't think they would have been devastated. I think part of it has to do with, and it's funny because I wrote one of the, which I left off my very long bio, but I wrote a play called Rhapsody in Seth, about this dichotomy I had of being talented, you know, and I'm not trying to be conceited, I just got lauded for my talent, but also gay. Yep. My parents kind of had also this weird low self-esteem. And I think I didn't want them to know that kids made fun of me in school because I felt it would bring them down as well. So I yep. I didn't feel like I could say kids hate me because they'd be like, oh, another depressing thing that's happened to us. You know, yes. so I really had no return. So my point is, yes, as a teen, it was not really great. My, so my father, they got divorced finally when I was 13, which by the way, I was happy about because I grew up with them fighting and hating each other. And they thought yeah. they were staying together for me. I'm like, break yeah. up. <laughs> like, this is a yeah. nightmare. Yeah. And actually it really helped because I wound up seeing my dad every weekend and um, it was great. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I discovered was there was a coffee soda. I think it's called Manhattan. Manhattan coffee soda that he would buy me and we'd mix it with milk. It was so good. I remember when I visited him in Brooklyn. So that part was good. I'd see my dad on the weekends. Um, but my mom... I think was really devastated that my dad left, but then was suddenly like, she was only 48 and she started dating. And and I was the last one in the house really. So it wasn't like you're on your own, but it was kind of, I'm on my own. So I would basically just always have these TV dinners, Hungry Man, which were delicious. Mm -hmm. And she kind of faded out. She was still very much part of my life and would come see all my shows, but it was, there were no more family dinners. Kind of, you know, I'm the youngest. So I was, it was kind of just me and my mom and her boyfriend and I was on my own food wise. Yeah. Were you physically bullied at all? You know what? It's funny. No, I was not. I, I was in fear of being physically bullied, mm -hmm. but I was definitely... Um, Shunned? I was mocked. Like, you never knew when you were going to be made fun of, mocked. So yeah. I didn't ever want to speak in class because you'd never know if someone was just going to like be like, faggot. Like, you didn't know what was going to happen. My books were going to yeah. be dumped. So it's this kind of PTSD that I have where... You don't know where you're going to be attacked from. And, you know, I part of my show, I talk about getting on the bus. I'd be like, I have to, you know, walk past the mean kids. I have to find an empty seat next to a kid who's not mean, but it, there can't be a mean kid in back of me. So it has to be the one seat that has a radius of nice kids or neutral. Like it was so much just constant yeah. work. And the worst was, yes, it was, it was um, verbal assaults, but it wears you down. Plus I was overweight. I lost weight. Um, I was definitely overweight, like sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then I lost weight, but my mindset never changed. So I always felt like I was fat. Mm -hmm. um, so I just always felt physically horrific and, you know, gay and an outsider. And yet, right. I'm more talented than any of you. So F you, I'll see you on Broadway. Like this weird combination I had of like a, a talent bully where I was yes. like, you're not talented. But also, oh my God, don't hate me because I'm gay. It's just, it was yes. a weird dichotomy I grew up with. Right. Well, I think in some ways, certainly not necessarily to these extremes, but that, uh, for instance, I'll give you, for instance, in terms of my case, I grew up in a small town in West Virginia hmm. where there were very few ethnic people, particularly not Greeks. Greek, yeah. And so I, I had a constant kind of radar about my contextual behavior when my parents were around, mm. for instance. If my parents were speaking Greek— I would move away from them. Right. If there was any shade of even a, a, a hint of somebody being anti-immigrant or anti-Greek or anti-Italian, whatever, you know, anybody who's an outsider, then I would compensate by being totally all-American. Oh. That's, that was my kind of way of dealing with the, with the stuff that was going on around me. 
And uh, it's exhausting. Yeah. When you're a kid, when you have so many other things that you really need to deal with that are, you know, peripheral to that. Uh, yeah. and not peripheral, that are more central to, you know, your development as a, as a human being. Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, empathetic in that regard. Uh, so you are, you are now in high school. Yeah. And, lost um, weight. yep. And, and you're, uh, and you're, you've lost the weight. Yeah. I lost the weight by uh, high school, but I never felt that I lost it, but I definitely right. did. I was super skinny. And by now you're performing. Yeah, I've been performing, you know, just to go back to Hal Linden, and it's funny you mention him, he really changed my life. He was in a revival of the pajama game that ran, oh, right. remember, it ran for a month, mm. and I was six or seven, and my family, instead of going to um, vacation for Christmas, we saw three Broadway shows. We saw Grease, Grease. we saw yep. Pippin, Ben Vereen. Mm-hmm. And this is when Broadway shows began at 8.30. So basically, I kind of fell asleep. I remember moments when I fell asleep. But we saw The Pajama Game. And that show blew my mind. Especially, hurry up. Hurry up. It's like three different parts. Hurry up. Can't waste time. The three different parts. It just, I was obsessed. And The Pajama Game, it only ran for a month. It was a really short-lived revival. It was him and Barbara McNair and Cap Calloway Jr. But it blew my mind. And I became obsessed with Broadway. So I was playing the piano at that point, And I was advanced. But I didn't, I wasn't obsessed with Broadway till The Pajama Game. So I was on a trajectory to do Broadway. So yes, I, when I was in fourth grade, I got into the high school show all the way home. I, there was a b- little boy part. So I always knew that I had talent. I was really advanced on the piano. I, my first professional job was Oliver with Shaney Wallace, who had done the movie. So mm. I was performing with a movie star and I was a little boy and wow. I, I had a soul. It was, so I knew that I was on the path and my older siblings were all really talented musicians and they were all moving and grooving. So right. I knew that I had a world outside of school if I could just survive it. And that was my thing. I was like, I mean, I was like, I have to, God, I'm, I am getting emotional. I was just like, I have to get through this to get to my life. I wish uh, I had an escape, Yep. but there was nothing I could, I couldn't go to performing arts high school. There weren't any on Long Island. Uh, I couldn't be, I guess I could have been homeschooled, but it wasn't even an option. And I couldn't mm-hmm. tell my parents how much I hated school. Maybe if I told them they would have taken me out, but I couldn't tell them. So when you say, so yes, I was in high school and I was performing and I was, um, I was in chorus, chorale, orchestra, band, doing shows. And I mean, this is not about food, but just on a side note, because I talked about the whole, I was a talent bully. So I was being bullied, but I was a talent bully. Yep. I wound up um, butting heads with my theater teacher. So one theater teacher that I had in 10th grade loved me. I had I was the lead in all these different shows. And then this other theater teacher really tried to break me down and didn't help me get rid of my snobbiness. He basically tried to like shame me. So he just didn't cast me in the show, which was, you know, and it it didn't really teach me a lesson. It just humiliated me. So the point is by the time high school ended, I wasn't performing in any plays anymore because I was boycotted mm. from the theater department. Oh, wow. So it was, yeah. So that part was horrible. But yeah. I began to have friends finally. And, I, you know, I was performing and I, I got into Oberlin really young. I got my first audition I got. So I, I knew there was a world. And just on a side note, when I went to Oberlin to um, uh, look at the school, I it was the opposite of being on Long Island. I always call it, I just call Oberlin a gay bar with dorms. Like, <laughs> which, you know, I was just like, oh, this is like a gay bar, but there happen to be dorms here. Like, it was so open, so liberal. Yep. And, I, and I got an early admission that I was like, I'm going here. So by the time senior year was in the middle, I was like in a great right, You were gone, mode. right. I was in a great mood. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how wonderful. However, I will say, I'll tell you one more horrible thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> When you ahead. say to come out to your parents, and this is all in my show rap scene, Seth. But when I, and I'm, it's weird. It's like talking about this. I do definitely feel emotional. I don't want to be. No, please. But uh, that's I, what the show is about. I it's know, about but memory. it's like. It's about memory. I, Not just about food, but memory. But so, God, it's so weird that it is. It's interesting what's devastating to you. But basically, right when I, I was so happy to get the fuck out of school. And right when I graduated, the yearbook came out and someone filled out my form and gave it in and changed my nickname to Queer Boy. And it got printed in the yearbook. Oh, yeah. And it was devastating. Oh, and God. my parents knew and, you know, they were always litigious about everything. And it's kind of comedic because they were always suing. So they're like, <laughs> I mean, it was what? like, no matter what, my father loved writing two-page letters and they loved yep. it. So they were like, we're going to sue the school. And the lawyer said to me, 
we can only sue if you're not gay. It has to be considered libel. It can't be a mean nickname. This oh. was before. So I had to say I'm not gay. So yep. it all led to eventually my parents finding out that I was gay. But So I never came out on my own volition. I came out because mm -hmm. I was basically forced to because right. of what happened in high school. The yearbook outed you. Yeah, the yearbook outed me because I, I, wow. I had to tell the truth finally. First I said I was straight, but they kept pressuring me. By the way, I hadn't had sex yet. Like, so I wasn't even gay, but I knew that I liked boys. So I had to say, I guess I am. I mean, it was so stupid. Mm -hmm. I was so young. I, was, I graduated yeah. a year early. I was only, I was 17. So I wasn't, you know, swinging. I just thought boys right. were cute. So anyway, that's how my parents found out. So high school was a fucking nightmare. That's the end of the story. Yeah. <laughs> and it comes at a time that that transition from, uh, from teenagerhood to semi-adulthood when you go away to college uh, at a time when your brain's not totally developed. Right. <laughs> you know, your emotions are still a completely in a kind of, you know, you're in a, a tumble-dry <laughs> washing machine uh, um, emotionally. You don't know how you feel about things. You're not sure about who you are, who you're going to be. It's a very confusing time. And to have something like that happen right in the middle of it, is uh, obviously, but it must have been very devastating. You know, they did it to two other boys. And the one thing I'll say is, and having talent, which is just God given, yeah. saved me because one of the other boys really, I think he, it was like they called him, I don't know if it was stupid or whatever, but he didn't really have much in life. And I don't know how yeah. he survived the mean nickname of the yearbook versus mine, where I was like, I'm going to Oakland, yeah. I'm going to Broadway. So, I was always able to survive because I knew I had a path somewhere. I was yes. very lucky to have that. Very, very. Um, all right, so you're finished high school. You're at Oberlin. Were there any food revelations there? Well, to just go back to high school for one second. My high school yeah, yeah, sure. served coffee in the morning and- What? Yeah, with buttered rolls. And I remember I would cut band- to go to the cafeteria, which still had it. And that's when I began to be obsessed with coffee with milk and sugar. And Mr. Uh, Work, his name is Mr. Work, was our conductor. I was a tuba player. I hated the tuba. But <laughs> I'd always hear, he'd be conducting and there'd be a silence. And he'd be like, where the hell is Rudetsky? <laughs> and I was always in the cafeteria having my delicious, <laughs> oh, so good, coffee, milk, and sugar. Were you assigned to the tuba? Y no. Because I there weren't enough tuba players and you were a musician? You know, I made a lot of stupid choices. I played the violin for a year and I was really good and I quit. And I'm so mad that I did. And then I took it up yeah. again much later in high school and I still have not gotten good at it. Then I tried to play the flute, but I couldn't make a sound. So I was like, I'll do the opposite of the flute and play the tuba. But it was literally just... That's all it was. It was so boring. Yeah. And I was five foot, like 150. So I was like a fat kid holding the fat tuba. It was... Um, I couldn't get a date. So anyway, I kept cutting, but I loved my delicious coffee with milk and sugar in high school. And my big treat was um, leaving high school because we got to leave, I think, junior year uh, and go off campus. And I would get a BLT back in the day when I had bacon. Oh my God, a BLT with mm. mayonnaise is so delicious, oh. but never again. Um, uh. In terms of height, in terms of college, Oberlin, um, one of the most delicious things was Oberlin had a cereal bar in the morning. So it's like, mm. to this day, I can cheer myself up the whole day by going, tonight I'm going to have a giant bowl of Fruity Pebbles. Like, it puts me in the best mood. I just literally have them upstairs. I have Cocoa Fruity Pebbles Fruity Pebbles, upstairs. speaking of sugar. Fruity Pebbles, Cocoa Pebbles, Captain Crunch. I have yeah. Golden Grams. So that cereal bar at Oberlin, oh my God, unlimited yeah. cereal, so delicious. So that was one of my discoveries. Where you have a little a little bit of grain with a lot of sugar. Oh yeah, I mean, get, I don't need the grain part. I just want the sugar. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so so off to college. Yes. Uh, and uh, were, you, were you on your own at all or were you in a dorm situation the whole time you were there? I was in a dorm situation for uh, the first year. My roommate moved out and I think now I realized because I was gay, which is hilarious because it's such a liberal school. I didn't think anything of it, but for weeks people were like, I heard he moved out. I just kept thinking he moved in with a friend, but I, I now realize that's why everyone was so like, he moved out, right? And I was like, yeah. But I got another roommate who was a composition major. And if you don't know, Oberlin definitely was like, we don't want, you know, we don't want tonal music. So his kind of music was, I made a hanger and each thing on the hanger, the mobile is a note. And wherever the wind blows, that's the piece. So 
He was a composer <laughs> and he prided himself that he reversed his hours. So I'd be going to class, he'd be sleeping all day and then he would wake right. up at midnight. So I had a crazy roommate who was nice, but out of his fucking mind. <laughs> Sophomore year, I had a roommate and then junior and then junior year, which is when my brother actually passed away, um, it coincided with, I moved to New York. I did a semester as an intern at the Equity Library Theater. Oh. And it was great. I lived in New York City and my big treat treat was that we get I called them gyros, but they were gyros. Gyros. Uh, yes. I lived on 46th on 46th Street in the dump, which is now really fancy. Now it's called the Paramount. But when I lived there, it was called the Century Paramount Hotel mm -hmm. on 46th Street. Mm -hmm. And it was a dump, but right on the corner it was those gyros and oh uh, 46th and what? And eighth. You know that, that and nice, eighth avenue. Yeah, yeah right yeah, across yeah. the street from uh, the Imperial. Right. So I lived there the first semester. I worked at I was an intern at the Equity Library Theater and you it were, was great. you were right in the theater district. Yes. You were yeah. I second acted shows all the time and I had uh, an allowance for money and no kitchen. So, you know, I would get my gyros, I would get scrambled egg. I, you know, my favorite meal of the day is and has always been breakfast because as a vegetarian, you don't feel duped of anything. It's like, mm -hmm. I love eggs, I pancakes, toast, coffee, veggie, sausage, but I love it. So that's right. my absolute favorite meal of the day. Yes. Well, I mean, you're missing bacon and sausage, but what the, the veggie hell? versions are so good. Oh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So yeah, I never Th thought that was missing. There's a veggie sausage. We I got a veggie sausage from Morgan Morningstar Farms. Mm. The sausage links. Do you I know, know that those. one? They're so good. Well, uh, there was a time when I was a, a vegetarian as well uh, uh, my, during my first marriage to Susan. Oh, uh, of course. We went through a vegetarian period, and uh, the, the the main difficulty I found, and you probably find this to a certain extent as well, is that we were traveling a lot. Yeah, and traveling makes it really very difficult. You're you're basically eating eggs and cheese all the all the time, and nuts, and nuts. Yeah, it's an it's a nachtmare. Yeah. and yeah. I mean, even in America, I'll go to like a Chinese restaurant with like brown rice. You're like, you mean fried? I'm like brown rice. You're like, I don't know what that means. No, no, no. Got to go to a specialty place. Even now, yeah, yes. So Oberlin and f the food there was was it. Amazing. Wonderfully well prepared. It was great. There was a there was a veggie dorm, so you could go to veggie for lunch. Oh, wow! And something I never did, but I would visit. There was there were co ops, so people would live. It's very sixties Oberlin, very hippie. Yeah. So you'd live there, and then you also had to prepare all the food. So right. once in a while, I'd visit my friend there, and it'd be like, you know, we made these buckwheat pancakes. I'm like, they're flavorless. But anyway, um, <laughs> that was one of the things that people did. I I went. I was. I ate anything at Oberlin, just constant, like I said, taco bars, cereal bars. Oh, it was, mm. I love, it's weird that like I wasn't so fat back then, but I was really young. But anyway, I ate nonstop and I was in ballet class, so maybe that's why I stayed skinny. Yeah, and your metabolism was different too. I from know, From when you were man. in high school. Yeah. By the way, I, you know, I feel like I'm going to stand up and people are going to see me. I'm going to be like 700 pounds, but I'm really not heavy right now. But I feel like I'm tricking people if they're watching me on Zoom that they think like I'm a, I'm <laughs> right. a fat From the neck up. Right, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> actually, we came up with that term at Oberlin. We called it the table syndrome because you're with someone at lunch. You're like, oh, they're so cute. And then they get up and you see that when they get up on the table, they're 700. Anyway, that's why it's the table syndrome because at the table, they're cute. When they stand up, 800 pounds. Yep, yep, yep. <sighs> <laughs> Anywho. All right. So, so Oberlin. Then what was the transition from Oberlin to Broadway? To how did that happen? First summer, I worked at um, uh, a camp where I was a music director. It was just a camp. And... It was interesting. I was just turned 18. It was with my best friend, Ben, who was also gay. All the kids are from Long Island and basically like the kids in our high school. So we were in charge of the theater, but I mean, we were mocked nonstop. And it was to the point where when I, my father picked me up, I remember bursting into tears because I felt I had, a, I had a shutdown for two months. And the joke is, I said to Ben a couple years after, I said, you know what? I said, we did actually laugh a lot that summer. And he said, Seth, that's like saying the card game we played at Treblinka was fun. And I was like, okay, you're right. Because it was, it was devastating. But right. then lo and behold, my sophomore year at Oberlin, um, I had, I had uh, there was a show Can Can. And I was the second piano player at Oberlin. Plus I was one of the dance soloists. And this is the college production? Yeah, college production of yeah. Can Can. My yeah. friend Jeff Caldwell was the music director. I was second keyboard, but I also did like this posh dance. And um, he worked at a summer stock called Surf Light Summer Theater in Beach Haven, Long Island. And he was the music director. And he said, I need an assistant for the summer. And that's what began my professional career. So I was the assistant music director at Surf Light, which was incredible and which still exists. And there's a great, there's a great full circle ending. But mm -hmm. Surf Light was 12-week, one-week stock, 
meaning you're there for 12 weeks and every single week you do a different musical. And it wasn't hard for me because I was reading the music, but these actors, I mean, full out. So you're rehearsing Promises, Promises. Then the next week you put it on at night, you're rehearsing applause during the day. The next week you do applause at night, you rehearse Grease during the day. The next week you do Grease at night, you do Evita. I mean- Summer stock. It was amazing. Like summer stock. Summer yeah. stock. Seven nights a week, your day off was Sunday afternoon. So that was fantastic. And that really led me to professional theater. We had our meals prepared. This guy named uh, Joe Lane did our cooking. My favorite meal was something he called schlock, which was like, again, it was kind of like sausages, potatoes. It was all yep. in a big pot. Oh, it was so delicious. Kind of like a big hash. Yes. Yep. Those are the days when I ate anything, man. Um, so that was my professional career. And then I did that every summer. I became the music director at Surflight. And by the way, the full circle moment is the show that I wrote on Broadway called Disaster, Surflight is now doing this summer. So it's like a nice- uh. Oh, which is so oh, nice. that's wonderful. Isn't that great? It's like, that's so I began. great. Were you at the same time taking any kind of conducting classes? Yes, very good question. Uh, yeah, okay. I was conducting at Oberlin with this Midwestern teacher who'd always say, measure eight. I'm like, measure? It's pronounced measure. So anyway, I, learned, <laughs> um, I learned how to conduct at Oberlin. And sadly, a lot of probably, not all of them, but there are many probably conductors who don't have any conducting skill. And it's extremely frustrating. Yeah. Um, and for those of you watching the video, um, I made my career, which we'll talk about at some point, but as a sub piano player, meaning that I was the understudy. So when you're a sub, you want to look up and know what beat you're on. But so many conductors don't learn patterns. So they just conduct down beats. So you're like, I have mm. to come in on the fourth beat. You look up and you're like, I have no idea what beat you're on because where, you're just going you like, are. yeah. Whereas when you learn conducting, you learn beat patterns. You so, learn where the first, third, second, third, and fourth beats yes! are. Yes. Visually. Visually. And you have to really, I didn't realize that. Oh yeah. So that way I look up and I say, oh, they're on two, they're on three, they're on four. Plus, you have to learn, one of the hardest things we had to learn was you, to not do count-offs. So in other words, we had to learn Beethoven's fifth. So you have to go, you have to go upbeat. But on, on Broadway, you can literally go two, three, four, which is so lazy. And we were never allowed to do that. But I really learned conducting skills on Broadway. The, the right the way. The right way, yeah. So yeah. I learned that at Oberlin. However, the bad thing about Oberlin, the good thing about Oberlin is you can do whatever the hell you want. Mm. I, I, my first year, there's something called winter term. You put together whatever you want for the month of January. So I got a full orchestra together and I played Rhapsody in Blue, like whatever Whoa. you want to do. It was really fun. That must have been terribly exciting. Oh my God, it was amazing. I was Ugh. 18 or 19. However, there's very little respect for musical theater, which is typical in, oh. you know, my friend, not to name drop, but Audrey McDonald went to Juilliard and we had the same issues where the staff so looks down. So even though I was, um, Learn, doing a lot of musical theater, it was all like, you can have this storage closet as your theater. Like, you know, the real theater was for the opera and for like Strindberg. But when we yes. were put on Wonderful Town, it was like, we were paying $20,000 a year back in the 80s, which was a lot. And they wouldn't allow us to have a theater. And one of my comedy stories is I was doing a little night music, conducting it. And the harp player was like, oh, by the way, I can't play the entire show. And I'm like, all right, I guess leave when you have to. And we weren't given a theater. So the stage was the same thing as the orchestra. So we were on one side and the stage was there. And in the middle of the show, she had to leave, but she had her harp. So during the show, you just hear like, squeak it a squawk at a squeak it a. She had to walk in front of the, so squeak it a squawk. Because we didn't have a pit. So she had to just walk out with a harp. So anyway, I was able to do Broadway, but it was very much looked down upon. So I was a classical piano major, knowing I was never going to be a classical concert pianist. Yeah, right. But I got in and I was like, all right. Um, so anyway, I was learning conducting and I was doing Broadway. I was doing comedy. I was hosting uh, my own radio show. I was doing a lot of fun stuff because Oberlin allows mm -hmm. you to do whatever. I was taking mime, whatever the hell you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, that classical training has de definitely stood you in good stead all the way through your career. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the lucky people because usually people can play classical or they can play pop. But because I grew up with my older brother and sisters, my sister would always be like, can you please, you know, play the song from A Star Is Born? So I grew up accompanying, you know, playing a chorus line, mm -hmm. accompanying my sister on pop music all the time. So I, I'm able to play pop music and read chords, but I have classical training so I could do both. So I was very lucky that I had both at the same time. Right. And also that you can handle composers who are much more challenging. Oh my God. Michael John Lacusa, I used to play a lot of his shows. And I mean, I basically have tendonitis to this day because of it. So yes, and I was able to play Ragtime, which is very classical. I was able to play a lot mm -hmm. of the harder piano books because I had that Oberlin training. You're totally right. Right, right. Now, you and I met when you were working with Joanna. Yes. My wife, on her show, which developed into basically another show 
but uh, originally we did it in uh, Provincetown. Yeah. And I have the good fortune to have been a part of your band. Right. At so the time. Because I was a drummer in high school, and, and Joanna uh, convinced me, I, I was going to say coerced, but she convinced me <laughs> to, to play the drums. And, and it was a great return because there's nothing in my life that has been more rewarding other than a few of my, I mean, I'm talking in terms of my artistic life, not necessarily my personal life. Uh, there's been more rewarding than, and I can name them on one hand, but one of them in particular is playing in a band, hmm. playing drums in a band. Yeah. I was in a rock and roll band in high school. And also, uh, we would we would go to, uh, after we'd play regular gigs where we played mostly covers for di- people who were dancing, then we would go to African-American clubs in the vicinity because we had a guitar player who was a blues guitar player who learned from a, a, a black, a great blues guitarist, and wow. we would go and play with black musicians. I mean, it was just wonderful. And then in college, being a member of something called Choral Union, hmm. which was essentially anybody on the campus could go for uh, an hour or two a week, and you prepared one one uh, mm-hmm. set piece. We did the Car- Carmina Burana. We did the Brahms Requiem. Yes. We did uh, the Mozart Requiem. Oh. A- and to be with... To be in in physical and psychic and emotional sympathy, on a, on a very sort of high level, with other musicians, mm-hmm. there's something about that that's just so transcendent. That's why I, you know, Cheetah Rivera always talks about how much she loved being a chorus dancer. She said, like, mm. you learn so much, you know, that you're someone to one side, someone to the other side, you're even, yeah. it's the same thing when you're in an orchestra. It's thrilling because you're all part of one big piece. I, I agree with you. I love, I love playing, when it's a good piano part, I love playing yeah. in orchestras. Yeah, yeah. And also singing with people together. Yes. Because that's, that's vibrational as well. Man, you, you, I, you know, funnily- In just, harmony. On a side note, I, you know, as part of the bio you read, my husband and I do something called Stars in the House, and it was yeah. always virtual, virtual, and now we're able to do it all together. And we had the cast of Almost Famous on the show. We had them all where I am right now, this little tiny area in our oh, apartment. Wow. And Tom Kitt lives nearby. So during the live stream, I was like, Tom, can you come over here? And he came over and he played three songs from the show and everybody sang. And being in the room with like 12 people all singing their harmony with no mic. I'm like getting chills with no microphones. It was like Uh, that vibration. It's so beautiful to have that kind of sound. I mean, I think about the opening for Light in the Piazza. Like, Uh, oh my God. That's one of the great experiences of my life as well. end of that. And we. I mean, God, how can you not get chills every time you were there for that? I would say to my audience, the folks who are listening uh, and those who are watching, that uh, the uh, experience that Seth and I grew up with, which was uh, uh, working in the theater with no mics Uh. so that you weren't working with amplified sound, you you really had, as in opera now— for instance, operas yeah. continue the tradition of n- no microphones. It's the voice. Uh, is there's nothing, nothing to compare it to. It's a necessity now because it's the convention. Everybody expects it, um, and it's just what is. I'm afraid you missed something, folks, by not being able to see theater without amplification. It's funny because you think about back in the '70s. I was just remembering this recently. To get the sound with a microphone, people had to hold mics. That's why in hair, yeah. they're holding microphones. In Greece, they're holding mics. Now it's just yep. normal. And I also remember being in Summerstock as music director and telling the choreographer, like, you can't put a turn on that in the middle of that song because their voices are going to be facing backwards. You're not going to be able to hear them. Now you don't think about that because everyone has a body mic. But back yep. in the day, you right. had to face out to have the sound heard. Yes. Right. Uh, exactly. Man, I uh, miss I it. Know. But those the, vi- it's the the vibrations is what you're talking about. It's yeah, it's magical. Exactly. And especially when you're in, and also when you're in close proximity. I, those of you who yeah. are listening who've had the experience of uh, sitting around a piano with friends exactly. and singing a song, and maybe somebody breaks out in harmony. Yeah. There's something about that that is um, uh, transcendent and cosmic. And I don't know how else to describe it, except that it's a wonderful experience. I completely agree. And we're going to start doing that actually for stars in the house. We're going to start having sing throughs and musicals. So isn't that great? We're going to, I want to get the cast of falsettos here. I want to get gospel. We should do light in the piazza and we're just going to sit at the piano 
it's so amazing. It's like you're oh. in high school again. That's what it reminds me of. When you're in high yeah, school, yeah. you're all just saying. Exactly. Well, now that we've gone back in time. Yes, dear. Uh, I have a, a question to uh, that will conclude our conversation. Yes. I ask everyone, if there is a moment in time, mm-hmm. be it in your childhood or even in your adulthood, in which when you when there's a particular smell mm. or a particular taste of food mm-hmm. that takes you back mm-hmm. to a moment that was a joyous moment or uh, i had a guest uh, earlier today who it brought her back to a, <laughs> a very unpleasant moment but what ended up being a positive experience uh would what would that be in your life i would definitely say charcoal on a barbecue because uh, it was a special occasion, but it happened often enough that it wasn't, you know, never. And mm-hmm. we had a small backyard on Long Island. Our house had a giant front yard for no reason. We were on a busy street, so it was never used. But we had the small backyard. My dad had mm-hmm. that barbecue. He would, I remember those coals and he would spray it and I would smell it. And it was, I loved, it was so fun because we'd eat outside, which is so different too. So like we had this little glass table and he would get the charcoal going and it was just a special occasion. And we sometimes have family, like friends come over. So that is such a fond memory. And I don't really actually smell that anymore because I don't think I've been to a barbecue. I can't even imagine how many years, but if I do smell it, it reminds me of a really great time with my family. I love Mm. it. My mom oh. would make iced tea. Remember, I think it was called like high C, um, 4C iced tea, a big pitcher of 4C iced tea, uh-huh. which was not normal either. So it was all these little special occasions. Oh, so good. So yes, that. So it was as much about the, the, the smell brings back the event yeah. of being outside cooking, cooking with your family. I want to thank Seth Rudetsky. Seth, it's always a joy talking to you. I have such a great time. Thank you for taking this time with me and being on Cooking by Heart. I had a real dog day afternoon. Take care, Seth. Thank you. Bye, Chrissy. All right. Bye-bye.